spent time in Benghazi. Uh, the President Obama's rationale, there would have been a massacre in Benghazi. What is your sense of it? You know, that's a tough question. I, I tell you, if anything, I've learned anything over the past couple of months is that my power of prediction is, is, is really bad. And I feel like I made wrong calls at every turn. Um, I, I didn't see a massacre happening in Benghazi, but I could be wrong about that. I, you know, I, it was hard for me to see that, that Colonel Gaddafi would actually re try to retake Benghazi itself. I, I, my sense was that he was going to try to let it, you know, divide from within, that he was going to send in provocateurs, that there was going to be agitation. I didn't see a full, you know, f you know a full assault on the, on the city by his soldiers. And, but I could be wrong about that. I just, you know, I guess my own instinct was that he was going to try to encircle those areas that were rebellious. Um, I know that is the justification for the no-fly zone. I, you know, um, whether it's the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do, it, it's difficult to say. I don't see where this goes, necessarily. I mean, I think in some ways we're, you know, we've seen the easy revolutions, if we can call them that, in Egypt and Tunisia. I think Libya, in some ways, is a window on, on change that's going to be, you know, it's going to be violent. It's going to take a long time. I think we are on the right trajectory toward a you know, far healthier, far more vibrant Arab world. But, but I think Libya is a window on, on some of the challenges that are going to be out there. It's an it's a opposition that is very loosely united, if even that. Um, it's an opposition that hasn't articulated a vision for the future necessarily, and it doesn't articulate that vision because it knows the divisions that, that reside within its ranks. We're seeing a, a government that's utterly unaccountable, that's determined to hang on. I think we're already seeing the cracks and fissures within that government that could lead to more fighting as, you know, as the remnants um, of the regime uh, try to maintain or try to keep some shred of power. And your thoughts on this latest news uh, about the possibility of the uh, Gaddafi sons uh, being involved with a future of Libya, with the father, well, perhaps stepping away, Muammar Gaddafi? Yeah, it's hard to imagine, I have to say. And it's hard to imagine—I mean, who knows what deal some in the opposition might cut, um, you know, with the sons. But it, it just, you know, given how entrenched the sons, especially Saif al-Islam, are in the regime, you know, how closely identified they are with the regime. And we have to remember, Saif al-Islam was using some of the most vulgar language, you know, I think mimicking his father when he was talking about crushing this, this uprising and crushing the opposition. Um, he does seem too closely identified with the government for me to—to to me to be an alternative figure, but, you know, again, I might be wrong about that. Um, I think what's more likely probably is the sons, you know, you know perhaps fighting each other as they, as they try to push the father aside. Um, and again, I think that's a more of a short-term thing. It's, you know, I think we are looking at a far more sweeping change in that country, but I think it's something that could last, uh, you know, it could take years. You covered Iraq for years. Uh, do you see parallels between Saddam Hussein and his sons and Gaddafi and his sons? You know, I, I, I think there are some, you know, loose parallels, some kind of superficial parallels. I think Saif al-Islam is, you know, is far more sophisticated in some ways than, than Saddam's sons were. I don't, that's not praise by any means. I think just the way he fashions himself and tries to come across. What, what strikes me, though, I think, and especially the difference between Iraq and, and Libya, is that Iraq, there were the institutions of a state. There was the party, however much that was beholden to Saddam in the end. I mean, it did become an instrument uh, of Saddam and that kind of very small clique around him from decree. What, what strikes me about Libya is just how this idea of perpetual revolution, which, you know, was rhetorical, you know, obviously, but how this idea of perpetual revolution over more than four decades basically just wiped out the institutions that were within Libya. Um, when I was in a town in eastern Libya called Beta, it was, it was remarkable to me how it wasn't just the challenge for the opposition to build, you know, to kind of reform or revise the state or, you know, to try to create some kind of transition toward a new form of rule. It was how do you construct a state from the very beginning? Uh, there was a sense that it was basically managed chaos or managed anarchy for four decades, and they really were starting all over. I think that's the challenge that, that the opposition and the rebels are going to face looking forward. Um, you know, how do you build institutions in a state without them? What kind of institutions, or I guess what kind of, you know, what can you rely on to navigate a transition? Um, what is going to be the genesis of this, of this new vision for the country? Um, it really is a, a wreckage right now, and I, and I think that's one of the greatest legacies of this, of, of four decades of, of Colonel Gaddafi's rule. Anthony Shadid, we last spoke to you in Tunisia. Um, this rolling rebellion that has been taking place, Tunisia, um, Egypt, uh, Bahrain, Yemen, Libya, 
can you talk about the different natures of these rebellions, different characters, and also what makes them similar, what you've observed? You know, I, I do think that Egypt and Tunisia were, the, in some ways, the easy revolutions. And they're revolutions that are still unfolding. I think, especially Tunisia, where the demands are, are very pronounced uh, over what kind of change uh, the opposition or, or, you know, or the revolutionaries want to see in Tunisia. I think Egypt is absolutely still a work in progress, and I think it, and it's a fascinating one. It's not coincidence that those two countries have, I think, the deepest sense of national identity. Um, the divisions within those countries are not that great or not that pronounced. I think when we look at, uh, at countries elsewhere in the Arab world, it, it does become much more complicated in some ways. I think we, in Libya we have that problem that I was just talking about, the, the lack of any real institutions to navigate a transition. I think when we look at countries like Bahrain, Yemen, and especially Syria, there are divisions, you know, ethnic sectarian divisions under the surface that I think frighten a lot of people, and I think especially so in Syria. I think Syria is the country that a lot of people are going to want to watch, uh, that the implications of change there I think are, are as great as, uh, as the implications were in Egypt. Syria is obviously a much smaller state. It doesn't have the power, the prestige. It doesn't have the history of Egypt. But it is at this kind of nexus of interest between Iran, Israel, Hezbollah and Lebanon and neighboring Lebanon. And I think any change in the calculus there, any change in the arithmetic in Syria is going to have far-reaching uh, impacts across the region. You are the Beirut bureau chief for The New York Times. Talk about Lebanon and Jordan. You know, Lebanon, how do you describe Lebanon? It's so, it's remarkable to me that amid all this change in the region, and again, it's hard to overstate how great this change and this transformation is. I, mean, I think for the first time, absolutely, since I can remember, but, you know, perhaps that a lot of people can remember, the region is speaking uh, with an indigenous vocabulary. You know, it's speaking about its own vision. It's articulating its own vision. It's so radically, fundamentally different from the change that was, you know, imposed on Iraq with, you know, through invasion and violence in 2003. Uh, this is a remarkable moment, I think, in the, in the history of the modern Arab world, and it's being articulated in a very forceful, fundamental way. Uh, in a way that's never been done before. Lebanon almost seems like a sideshow amid all these changes. And I think for a lot of Lebanese, it's difficult um, to see um, societies being transformed all around them. And Lebanon's still entrenched in this, in this centuries-old or decades-old, let's say decades-old, uh, system of rule that uh, in some ways makes the smallest identities the most uh, relevant, you know, form of affiliation. There is an effort, I think, in Lebanon to change that, to get, to get beyond these narrow sectarian identities and create something more, uh, something broader, some broader notion of, of belonging. But it's, uh, those efforts are so far hamstrung. There have been a few protests, but they really haven't gone anywhere. I think Jordan is going to be more interesting. And again, Jordan, I think, falls in, in some ways, it falls into that arithmetic that, that, that Syria still plays by. Um, Jordan is obviously an American ally. Uh, you know, you don't see the American government abandoning the, the monarchy there anytime soon. Uh, but it's also a complicated society with, you know, um, with its mix of Palestinians and Jordanians. Um, the king, his wife are not popular. Uh, you keep thinking that this is one, going to be one of the places that we're going to see change, you know, rather quickly, like Algeria, for instance. But it hasn't happened so far. But again, this is a years-long process, and I think it is going to take years. And you know, like I said, I think the easy revolutions are over. Now we're in we're in store for a much you know a much more difficult, much more precarious, uh, you know, but no less promising path toward you know fundamental change in, in, across the region. And then, can you talk about the U.S. response to these rolling rebellions? President Obama giving the major address he did in Cairo um, uh, soon after he was elected to the Muslim world. And then the responses to the despots who, not just Obama, but the administrations before, had shored up for decades. and holding on to the end and then seeing when it's inevitable making the shift. Can you talk about what the role has been? Sure. You know, I have to say, just you know, at the outset, it is—it's so, you know, as a reporter in Iraq, it so much was about Iraq and America, this conflict between—I mean, obviously, the Ameri United States invaded that country, and, and, and the society was wrecked over, you know, over— 
truly heartbreaking conflict that went on for years. It did strike me in Egypt, especially in Tahrir Square, when now, absolutely there was criticism of U.S. policy, criticism of Israel. But I think fundamentally the narrative that you heard in Tahrir Square was about what kind of Egypt are we going to construct? What kind of Egypt are we going to build? What is our vision for the future, especially vis-a-vis -a, -vis a government that basically kind of, you know, I mean, let's be blunt, a government that pretty much hated its people. Um, that was remarkable to me. And, I, and again, I, I keep using this phrase, but it, it was an indigenous vocabulary. It was a narrative that was being articulated on its um, on you know, people's own terms in Cairo and elsewhere. You know, I think the United States almost by default feels like it has to get involved, but you, you get the sense being in a place like Tahrir Square that the less involved they are, the better it's going to be. Um, I think there is. A, I think you know, critics out there would see a, a level of cynicism on how this is unfolding in terms of U.S. and Western intervention. I think it's no, it's no coincidence that that France and Italy, both with you know interest in, in the future of Libya's oil, were the first to recognize Libya's opposition government, along with Qatar. Um, and I think there's, you know, critics are, you know, right to point out that, you know, we haven't seen a, a uniform standard in how American and Western intervention plays across the region. Um, we saw much more forceful response in, in Libya compared to what we've seen in Yemen or Bahrain. Yemen and Bahrain, obviously, both being strategic allies to the United States and the West. Um, it is, you know, it, American intervention has a has a pretty sad history in the Arab world, and you do wonder, you know, how how well that lesson is understood as we go forward, because it is, like I, and I keep saying this, I hate to be repeating myself, but it is going to be much more dangerous and much more violent as we go forward. And I think there's going to almost be a, you know, uh, you know, almost a fallback, you know, in, you know, how do I put this? There's going to be a desire to intervene, I think, as this gets more da dangerous and more complicated and more uh, more violent. But I think that uh, intervention, that very intervention, could could very well make things worse. In what way make it worse? Well, what way? This is probably beyond my pay grade, but it's uh, you know, it, I'm trying to think when it's gone well. Um, any time over the past, you know, couple generations, um, and I don't see it necessarily going well anytime soon. It's um, there is a um, there is a dynamic. I think that that violence, especially violence imposed from abroad, imposes on these societies, and that dynamic, you know, um, almost always promises unintended consequences. And it did in Iraq. It's doing that in Libya right now. I think this very prospect of, of what we're seeing, the violence in Libya, is going to have. Um, repercussions that are going to last for a long time, uh, and I think that that model of, or let's say those those unintended consequences, are something that almost um, by default happen with any intervention uh, anywhere. Rebel forces preparing to begin exporting oil in an attempt to raise money to fight the Gaddafi regime. A tanker expected to leave eastern Libya bound for Qatar containing one million barrels of high-quality crude worth about a hundred million dollars. Libya, Africa's third largest you know, producer of oil. That's right. You know, it's. I mean, everyone you talk, you're in Benghazi, you're placed in Beta, you're placed in, you're in Derna. It is. It is inspiration on what people are trying to create, the societies they want to create, uh, the vision they have for the future of, of a government that, for the first time in their lives, is going to reflect at least at some degree the aspirations of the people. At the same time, it's hard, at least for me, and I may be 100 percent wrong on this, but it's hard for me to see how this ends in the near term, in a good way in Libya. Um, I think it is going to become more violent, and I think it is going to become more divided as we go forward, not only within the government, but with the opposition as well. And, and I do worry about um, the way that violence is becoming endemic in some ways to this uprising, that uh, um, I do worry about everybody with a gun, uh, to be blunt about it. Anthony, are you planning to go back to the Middle East? You know, I'm the bureau chief in Beirut, so I'm going back next week. But like I said, Lebanon is probably the quietest place in the Middle East right now. Uh, so I do want to get, try to hopefully get to Egypt, rather, you know, rather soon. I think, you know, I think one of these key narratives to better understand uh, when you look at the Arab world right now is is this kind of deal that's going to be made between political Islam and, and power. And I think that's something that's unfolding right now. I think we're seeing it in Egypt unfold in a, in a pretty forceful way. And it's, um, you know. It's a lot less dangerous to cover something like that, and I think in some ways more interesting. So I'm hoping to uh, try to tackle that when I get back.